Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And as always, many many thanks to all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. In today's part 10 we will talk about the so-called bolzano weierstrass theorem. It's a fundamental result you should learn in any analysis course. The statement itself is really short, such that I can immediately tell you it. For this we consider a sequence AN, which is bounded. And then we can conclude that this sequence has at least one accumulation value. Or to put it in other words, a bounded sequence of real numbers has to cluster somewhere. For this please recall, having an accumulation value or cluster point just means the sequence has a convergent subsequence. One possible visualization would be on the number line, where you have a lower bound and an upper bound. Therefore, all the sequence members live between those values. Of course, they may jump around, but we still have infinitely many of them. Therefore, you find at least one point where infinitely many sequence members cluster. Indeed, that's the whole statement of the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Okay, then I would say, let's start proving it. In order to do this, let's take the picture from above again. Let's call the lower bound C0 and the upper bound D0. Now the overall idea for the whole proof is that we just bisect the interval here. Then we have two intervals, two parts, and please remember, we want to find a subsequence here. Therefore, we will continue with the interval that has infinitely many sequence members in it, and ignore the other one. Therefore, the procedure is that we first look at the left interval and observe if we have infinitely many sequence members in it. Of course, it could happen that both intervals have infinitely many members in it, but then we would choose the left-hand side. Okay, so what we get is a new interval that has half the length of the one before. So either the upper bound or the lower bound changed. Therefore, we choose new names, namely C1 and D1. Then, maybe not so surprising, we bisect the new interval again. And then we repeat the selecting and the bisecting over and over again. Hence what we get in the end are nested intervals. We have our original interval C0 to D0 and the new interval C1 to D1 is a proper subset of this one. And then after repeating the whole process here, we get the next interval C2 to D2 which is once again a proper subset of the former interval here. Hence we have this inclusion as often as we want. Now the point of this statement is that the length of the interval gets smaller and smaller in each step. In particular, if we calculate d1 minus c1, we get one half of the original distance because we bisected the interval. In the same way, for d2 minus c2, we get one half of d1 minus c1. Or in other words, one quarter of the original distance. Okay, by knowing this, we can use induction to show the general statement for dn minus cn. We simply get one half to the power n times the length of the original interval. And there you immediately see, this is a nice sequence that converges to zero. However, we also get some information about the sequences dn and cn when we look at the picture again. First of all, we know they are bounded sequences because all the sequence members also lie in this interval. And secondly, we know the sequence cn can only increase where the sequence dn can only decrease. And now these things imply that the sequences are also convergent. Please recall, this is exactly the monotonicity criterion we discussed in former videos. It's important because we can use it very often as you can see. What we also can use very often are the limit theorems. From above we can use the fact that we already know this limit, which is zero. And now we've learned that we can push the limit inside the difference. Simply because both limits here also exist. So please note, our conclusion here is that the limits of dn and cn are the same. Therefore, finally we are able to define a subsequence for our original sequence an. We simply do that by choosing for a and k one of the infinitely many elements inside one of the intervals. With this we then know that a and k lies always between ck and dk. Please recall here again, if we increase k, the interval here gets smaller and smaller. And we already know, in the limit, the boundaries are the same. 
Or to put it in other words, here we can now use the sandwich theorem. It simply tells us that the sequence in the middle is also convergent with the same limit. And exactly this limit is our wanted accumulation value. Now this means that our proof is finished here. Ok, and that's the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Every bounded sequence has at least one accumulation value. And now I can also tell you this statement also holds when you consider sequences of complex numbers. So it's useful in many different situations. Ok, I think that's good enough for today, so I hope I see you next time. Bye!